In the last lecture, we began to look at the form and function of plants, focusing on differences and similarities in how complex multicellular plants develop from a single-celled zygote as compared to what we saw in animals. In today's lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of plant function uh, by looking at some of the mechanisms plants use to regulate aspects of their physiology, respond to stimuli, and otherwise coordinate and maintain their parts, if you will, in an adaptive fashion. We're going to begin by looking at how plants regulate their water balance by examining the control of a process called transpiration. And then we're going to look at how plants can respond to external cues, especially light, in a way that controls their growth in an adaptive fashion. As with the last lecture, the larger point of our discussion today is to expand our understanding of how complex multicellular organisms in general coordinate their parts and regulate their internal environment by taking another look at some of the issues we've already considered, but now from the perspective of multicellular plants instead of from the perspective of animals. Let's start by considering how plants manage their water supply. In a typical plant, water moves from the roots where it's absorbed from the soil upwards through the rest of the plant via the vascular xylem tissues. Much of the water taken in from the plant this way, or taken in by the plant this way, is eventually lost from the leaves through a process called transpiration. This is essentially evaporation from the surfaces of the leaves. Now, a huge amount of water moves through plants in this way. For example, one study estimated for a single maple tree that this tree had about 177,000 leaves. And they estimated that these leaves had a total surface area of about 675 square meters, so a big surface area. The same estimate suggested that on a single summer's day, this one tree would have have to have 220 liters of water per hour moving through it from the ground up in order to account for all of the water that it lost from transpiration, through transpiration from its leaves. That is, this tree had to be pumping 220 liters every hour all day long. This is a tremendous amount of water. And as we'll see, this tremendous amount of water is really part of the cost that the plant has to pay for the process of photosynthesis. Now, you might think, given the need to have an adequate supply of water, that plants would have evolved adaptations to conserve water, uh, preventing water loss from their leaves. And in fact, there are many such adaptations. For example, the epidermal cells of leaves typically are covered with a layer of wax, and this waxy layer really minimizes the loss of water from the cells on the outside of the organism. But most of the water is lost from leaves through actually specialized pores called stomata, or stoma is the singular form. These stomata can open and close, as it turns out. So there is a way, presumably, that the plant can control the amount of water lost through uh, transpiration. However, the plant faces a critical trade-off that puts restrictions on the degree to which it can reduce transpiration, on the degree to which it can prevent water loss. This trade-off has to do with the fact that leaves need to also have access to an adequate supply of carbon dioxide, which they get from the air. This carbon dioxide, as I mentioned, is a necessary substrate for photosynthesis to occur. Plants obtain the CO2 from the air, and they can only do so if there are ways for the air to get in to the inside of the leaves. So they need to have the openings of the leaves, the stomata, open enough to have an adequate supply of air going in and out. Now, if, the, if these stomata are open, the tree gains CO2, which it needs for photosynthesis, but it loses water. If the stomata are closed, the tree conserves water, but it gets little or no CO2. I should add that there are a number of other physiological reasons why the plant simply can't just simply turn off transpiration altogether. Actually, this movement of water from the base up through the leaves represents the way that the plant transfers critical nutrients from the soil to the rest of the plant. Furthermore, transpiration also is a physiological mechanism by which plants cool themselves. The evaporation of water from leaf surfaces actually causes evaporative cooling similar to the way that sweating in mammals cools down an animal's body. So the plant has to strike a balance, allowing stomata to be open enough to obtain CO2 
and to provide sufficient transpir uh, transpiration for other processes, but not allowing them to be open so much as to lose water excessively. In many ways, this problem shares much in common with the examples of homeostasis that we discussed for animals. At first glance, it might seem that regulating transpiration in a plant could have little to do with the problem of regulating temperature in an animal. Certainly, the nature of the problems faced and the particular mechanisms, physiological mechanisms involved, are completely different. But what these processes do hold in common is the need for feedback and control mechanisms that allow for the maintenance of the most favorable internal environment, given various signals that are coming into the organism. So let's take a look at the regulatory mechanisms that a plant has available to maintain a favorable rate of transpiration. Just as we did when we were talking about homeostasis in animal systems, let's begin by asking how a plant can modify the rate of transpiration. That is, let's ask what the effector is in this case. These openings of leaves called stomata actually are formed by a pair of specialized elongated cells called guard cells. And you can think of these guard cells as essentially being shaped like kidney beans. Imagine curved kidney beans with one on either side of an opening. And there's a little space in between these two guard cells. Now the way that these guard cells change their shape and thus change the degree to which the stoma is open or closed has to do with them taking in or releasing water. When these guard cells take in more water, they become turgid. The water fills their central vacuole and presses out against the cell wall, making that cell more stiff or turgid. When they release this water, then the cells become more flaccid. But these guard cells don't have uniformly stiff cell walls all around them. If you now imagine these two kidney-shaped cells on either side of the stoma, it turns out that the cell wall on the innermost surface the part that's on the inside that would form the pore of the stoma, actually have relatively thick cell walls that are relatively inflexible, whereas the cell wall on the outside of these cells is relatively thinner and therefore relatively more flexible. As a result, when these guard cells become more turgid by taking in water, they actually become more curved. And as they become more curved, they bow outward and with increasing turgidity, the opening on the inside increases in size. Now, you can understand this actually by making a simple model of a stoma by taking two long balloons and connecting them together at either end. Now, first place, before you connect them, place a piece of scotch tape on the inner surfaces of these balloons, the surface where the balloons would actually come into contact if they touch. Now, if these balloons are relatively flaccid, not inflated very much, they'll actually fit together quite nicely, and there'll be very little space between them. But you can imagine that as you blow them up, make them more turgid like a guard cell, these balloons will expand, but because the inner surface can't expand very much because you've put tape on it, then what happens is that most of the expansion occurs on the outer surface. And what you'll see is that these balloons will bow out, opening the space between them. That's how guard cells work. So, the turgidity of guard cells is what controls whether stoma are open or closed, but what controls how turgid these cells are? That is, what controls how much water they take up or lose? The amount of water taken in by guard cells depends on the concentration of ions in the cell, and particularly the ion potassium. A high ionic concentration on the inside of the cell brings water in the cell through the process of uh, osmosis. Actually, most of the potassium and water that enters the cell, as I said, are actually entering into this central vacuole structure, which brings home the importance of this kind of structure for the functioning of plant cells. So our real question then is to ask, um, what is it that controls the uptake of potassium by guard cells? In other words, what we want to ask is, what are those feedback signals that influence the um, activity of this effector? And what that means is we want to see what controls the amount of potassium that enters or leaves a cell. Now, it turns out that the way potassium gets into guard cells is through the activity of an ion channel. We've talked about those in the context of neurobiology, remember. This is an ion channel that is specific for the ion potassium. And also, it's an active ion channel, which means that it pumps potassium essentially uphill against its chemical concentration gradient. We saw ion channels like that again when we talked about how neurons worked. And specifically, you might remember the sodium-potassium pump, which maintains ion concentration across nerve cell membranes, which is actively 
uh, pumping, in this case, both sodium and potassium against their ion concentration gradient. So these guard cells have an active ion pump for the ion uh, potassium. It turns out that there are several kinds of signals that regulate the activity of these ion channels. For example, light itself stimulates guard cells to take up potassium. The effect of light actually makes adaptive sense because light, the presence of light, means that photosynthesis should occur. That means you want to have these guard cells open the stoma so that CO2 can get into the plant. Light triggers these ion pumps to pump more potassium into the guard cells, causing them to become turgid and opening up the, um, the stoma. When it's nighttime and light isn't available for photosynthesis and the need for carbon dioxide is reduced in most plants, not all, there are exceptions, but in most plants, then it makes sense that these stomas should be closed to conserve water. In the absence of light, the sodium pumps are down-regulated the, uh, the guard cells become more flaccid and the stoma close. Another cue that can influence the behavior of these potassium pumps actually is the concentration of CO2 on the inside of the leaf. This actually fits our notion of how homeostatic control works very well. CO2 needs to be regulated for photosynthesis to, be occur, to, to occur. If the level of CO2 ab falls below some critical set point, then that triggers an ion, uh, uh, a cell signaling mechanism which increases the activity of these potassium ion pumps, again, causing the, cells to causing the guard cells to become turgid and open up the stoma, allowing more CO2 to come in. We have, in response to a change in the parameter that we're regulating, a mechanism that counteracts that change, pushing the parameter in the other direction. Low CO2 causes guard cells to open up the stoma, which allows CO2 concentrations to increase again on the inside of the leaf. Finally, the amount of potassium that is uh, taken up by guard cells also can be controlled by a chemical signal, actually what we would call a plant hormone, um, a plant hormone called abscisic acid. Now, just like animals, plants have a large number of chemical signals that circulate through their bodies, affecting different kinds of target cells and tissues in different ways, and therefore regulating function. These chemical signals in plants function just the way as chemical signals in, in animals do in general, and we refer to them as plant hormones. Abscisic acid is a kind of plant stress hormone. It's produced in response to severe water deficiencies that are experienced by cells on the inside of a leaf. So if cells inside the leaf are severely deprived of water, meaning that more water is being lost from the leaf than should, these cells produce this hormone, abscisic acid, which then interacts with guard cells, stimulating those guard cells to actually lose potassium. Another set of ion channels, in these case passive ion channels specific for uh, potassium, open up. Potassium leaves the guard cells, they become more flaccid, and the guard cells therefore close the stomata, thus eliminating or reducing the water loss in response again to a stress signal that said that water loss was too great. So this example of how transpiration is controlled in various ways should make it clear that plants can regulate their internal environment through sophisticated feedback and control mechanisms just as multicellular animals do. Guard cells can mediate this trade-off between the need for CO2 and the need for water conservation on an almost instantaneous basis, integrating information they receive from a variety of external cues and internal signals. Now let's change the subject a little and look at another aspect of how plants can respond adaptively to external cues they receive from their environment. I made the point several lectures ago that one of the most useful tools animals have for maintaining a favorable environment is the ability to move. This point, you recall, led to our discussion of the molecular mechanisms responsible for the contraction of muscle cells several lectures ago. Now, although plants can't move in the same way that animals do, they do have a different means for responding to the environment um, in an adaptive fashion. Unlike animals, plants tend to have open-ended growth. They can con grow continually throughout their live lives. This means that the morphology of plants can constantly be tuned to the surroundings, to their surroundings, based on interactions they receive from environmental stimuli.
Now, the kinds of environmental stimuli that plants respond to are analogous to many of those that animals respond to. The essential difference is only that plants generally respond through, to these cues by growing in different ways, whereas animals can respond to these cues by moving. To make this point clear, consider the following experiment. This is an experiment that you can do at home. In fact, you probably do it all the time and you don't even realize it. Put a houseplant near a window. And what you'll notice is after some period of time, that plant will have bent over in such a way as to be pointing towards the window, facing all its leaves towards the window. Now, take that plant that's bent over and rotate it so all the leaves are facing away from the window. And again, again, give it more time. When you come back sometime later, the plant will have bent back, facing again towards the window. The plant is moving, essentially, so that it is facing its leaves towards the window. And this makes sense, because the window is the source of light for this plant, and light is the source of the plant's energy, essentially the way the plant can feed itself. So it makes sense it should have a mechanism to point its leaves in the best direction to get the most light. We call this kind of response, by the way, phototropism. Phototropism really just means orientation towards light. The question is, how does the plant do this? How does the plant bend towards light? Again, there are really two questions here. The first question is, how does the plant sense where the light is coming from? That is, what's the receptor? And then the second question is, what actually makes the plant bend? That is, what's the effector? Now, interestingly, some of the earliest experiments done to answer this question were done by Charles Darwin himself, in collaboration with his son, Francis. Darwin is known, of course, for his famous book, The Origin of the Species, but later in his life, Darwin went on and worked on all sorts of other problems in biology, including publishing in 1881 a book titled The Power of Movement in Plants, co-authored by Francis. In that book, Charles and Francis Darwin proposed how they thought phototropism and other kinds of oriented movements in plants might work. And they published the results of several really interesting experiments. The Darwins did their work with young oaks, o oat seedlings, oats kind of a grass. Now, ordinarily, these young seedlings show a very, very strong phototropic response. That is, if you take a very young seedling, just a single shoot, and um, uh, illuminate it from one side, it'll bend dramatically and very quickly towards the side where the light is coming from. Now, the Darwins hypothesized that it was the very tip of the growing oat shoot that contained a tissue that was able to detect and respond to light. And they tested this hypothesis in really an interesting way. What they did was they started by taking a young oat shoot and slicing off the tip of that shoot. So it no longer had the tissues of the tip. And when they did that, the oat shoot no longer actually responded to light. It would just grow straight up. So that showed there was something about the tip. Now, there's a problem with that experiment, because it may be that just by slicing off the tip, you're damaging the plant in some way and just making it unable to respond in any adaptive fashion. So they did an interesting control for that problem. They made little opaque caps that they would put, very small caps, on the top of the growing tip of a shoot. And these opaque caps wouldn't remove the tip, but they would prevent the tip from having any light reach it. And when they put an opaque cap on the tip of a shoot, again, the shoot didn't bend. Now, just to make sure that there wasn't some irritation or other physical stimulus of this cap that somehow was responsible for this, they did a third experiment where they actually made a, a transparent cap where light could penetrate it and put that on the oak shoot tip. And when they did that, the shoot bent towards light, as you would expect. Now, from these kinds of experiments, what the Darwins concluded, oh, I should add, by the way, that they did all sorts of other experiments, like they would cover up other parts of the shoot, and they show only the tip would cause this response. And they concluded that the tip not only sensed light, but then transmitted information about where light was coming from to the rest of the plant using some sort of chemical signal, some sort of hormone, if you will, that was passed from the tissues of the tip down to tissues that were lower down in the shoot, the tissues where the bending actually occurred. Now, the Darwins never got around to testing this hypothesis, but it was tested a number of decades later in the early 20th century by a Danish physiologist named Peter Boysen Jensen. Now, Boysen Jensen cut off and replaced the tips of growing oat shoots, separating them from the rest of the shoot by one of two kinds of materials. Boysen Jensen would cut the tip off and then either put a small gelatin block in between that tip and the rest of the shoot, put the tip back on the block, put the block on the shoot, or he would put a thin piece of mica, 
Now, the difference is that chemicals could pass through the gelatin, but they couldn't pass through the mica. And what he found was that if he separated the tip with a piece of gelatin, then the shoot would show a phototropic response, but if he separated it with a piece of mica, it wouldn't. And this provided strong support that there must be a chemical that's transmitted from the tip down to the rest of the shoot. Now, this is interesting, but this, we still have the question of figuring out how the signal causes the shoot to bend in the right direction. In other words, phototropism is an oriented movement. It's adaptive only to the extent that it causes a response in the correct direction. So how can some sort of diffusing chemical signal cause this oriented response? Well, this question was addressed in another set of experience, experiments, again, in the, rel in the early 20th century, uh, performed by a Dutch physiologist named Fritz Vent in um, 1926. Vent or Went, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Now, Went removed the tips from growing oak shoots and placed them on blocks of gelatin, just as, um, as um, uh, Boyce and Jensen did. In this way, what he could do is collect the chemical that was produced at the tip, since this chemical would diffuse into the block of gelatin. Then went placed these gelatin blocks on shoots that had had the tips removed and not replaced. And he did this in a series of experiments. First, he would take a gelatin block that had never been exposed to a tip, in other words, a gelatin block where there was no chemical in it, presumably, and he would put this on a shoot with the tip removed and find that that shoot would simply not grow. It wouldn't elongate, wouldn't do anything. Now, if he took a gelatin block that had had a tip on it and presumably had this chemical in it and just put it without the tip now onto a shoot that lacked a tip, then he would see that the shoot would grow. It actually would get much taller. Presumably, this was because some chemical that had come from the tip was transmitted into this gelatin block, and then when he put the block on the shoot, transmitted to the rest of the shoot, causing growth. But this didn't actually cause an oriented response. The shoot would just grow straight up. On the other hand, when Went took one of these gelatin blocks that had presumably the compound produced by the tip and put them asymmetrically on a shoot that had the tip cut off, he found that the shoot would change its orientation. It would bend away from the side where the gelatin block was touching. So if you put the gelatin block just on one half of this shoot that lacked a tip, then the shoot would bend away from where the gelatin block was. The implication of this experiment was that the gelatin block was transmitting some chemical only to one half of the growing shoot, and the half of the shoot that was getting the chemical would bend, would grow faster than the half that didn't have the chemical and cause a bent, an oriented bent response. Now this kind of experiment shows that an asymmetric distribution of some chemical coming from the growing tip of the plant is responsible for changes in growth down below that are causing this oriented response, but it still leaves us with another question. Specifically, the question is, how does light cause this asymmetric distribution in the first place, right? We want to explain why light coming from one direction causes the shoot to bend towards that direction. And there are two alternative hypotheses by which this could work that were quickly proposed. Um, the first actually was proposed by Wendt himself, who suggested that the chemical signal is produced uniformly in the tip, in the tip of this plant, but that light somehow causes this chemical to migrate, to diffuse away from where the light is. So the chemical is produced uniformly, but the presence of light on one side causes the chemical to move away to the other side, and so chemical would then transmit preferentially, mostly down the side of the growing shoot that was away on the shaded side of the plant. Now the alternative hypothesis that was proposed was that light somehow destroyed this chemical or prevented it from being produced in the first place. And in this case, the prediction would be that chemical was only being produced on the side of the tip that was in the shaded part of the plant. This, it, these two hypotheses were later tested in a very elegant experiment done by a plant physiologist named Winslow Briggs. Now what Briggs did was again use mica sheets, but he inserted a mica sheet vertically in a tip of a plant that he had cut off of an oak, oat shoot and not only uh, vertically divided this tip into two halves, but also used the mica to separate two 
um, gelatin blocks that these two halves were resting on. You get the picture, so now we've got a mica plate that prevents any chemicals from passing from one side of the other to the other, either of the tip that he's cut off or of the gelatin block on which it sits. Now, the two hypotheses propose or would suggest two very different predictions about what should happen in terms of the distribution of chemicals that you would collect in the gelatin blocks below this bisected tip. If light is actually destroying or preventing the production of this chemical we're interested in, then you would expect that the side of this tip that was exposed to light wouldn't produce any chemical or have any chemical, so the gelatin block underneath it would be devoid of chemical, whereas the shaded side would produce the chemical and the gelatin block underneath that would have the chemical present. And then if you took the light side blo uh, gelatin block and put it on a growing shoot, you would not get an oriented response. But if you use the shaded side block and put that on a growing shoot, you would get the orientation response. Now, the alternative prediction is if the chemical is actually produced throughout the tip, but light causes it to migrate towards the shady side, is that because there's now a mica plate that prevents any movement of chemicals from one side to the other, the chemical would be produced in the tip, and in spite of light shining on one side, you would still get the chemical appearing in both of the gelatin blocks down below. Well, when Briggs did this experiment, he found that the latter was the case, that if you, if you prevented the movement of any compounds laterally across the tip, then you would see that compound would appear down below each side, showing that light wasn't destroying this compound, but was instead just causing it to move. Well, it turns out that the compound that Darwin originally predicted should be there and that all of these experiments went on to demonstrate um, was really the first plant hormone ever described. Went called this chemical auxin, which comes from the Greek root meaning to increase. Actually, even though this auxin hormone was the first plant hormone ever described, its molecular basis, the, the molecular basis by which it, which it acts on plant cell, is still the subject of considerable research. We know that the major effect of auxin on plant cells is to cause them to elongate. And this makes sense in terms of how the plant is actually moving in response to light. The increased concentration of auxin on the shady side of the shoot caused by the asymmetric distribution of aux auxins that's caused by light on the tip, causes the cells on the shady side of the, of, of the shoot to grow relatively longer in the apical, or in the shoot to root axis, as compared to cells that are on the sunny side. And you can imagine if you have the same number of cells on each side, but cause cells on one side to grow longer, then the whole cylindrical structure will bend over in the direction of the light. And this is exactly what happens. Now, phototropism is just one example of how plants can detect and respond to cues in their environment and respond to them by changing patterns of growth. Actually, plants uh, exhibit many other kinds of tropisms in response to other cues. For example, if you place a plant seedling that you've taken out of the soil on its side to suspend it, what you'll find is that the shoot grows upward this makes sense if the light's coming from above because we now would expect that this phototropic response would cause bending towards the light. But the root of this plant will grow downwards. Now one possibility is that the root is growing downwards because it just simply has cells that have the opposite response to the distribution of auxins as cells in the shoot. But additionally, it turns out that the cells of the root also are able to detect gravity. And they do this by actually having small um, vesicles inside the cell body that are densely packed with starches that make them very heavy. And literally, these little vesicles filled with starch will settle down towards the ground in response to gravity, causing a greater density of these vesicles at the lower earth side of the cells. And this greater density triggers a cellular response that causes these plant cells again to change their shape in an adaptive fashion, causing the root to bend downward. And I should add that not all of the kinds of behaviors that plants perform by changing cell shape are slow, like these tropisms. In fact, you may be familiar with Venus flytraps, which can very rapidly change the morphology of structures associated with specialized leaves, and in so doing, actually move quickly enough to trap an insect inside them, getting a free lunch out of it. 
Similarly, when the compound leaf of a plant called mimosa, this is a sensitive plant, is touched, the leaf actually instantly collapses and its leaflets all fold together, presumably in a defensive response. What's interesting about this mimosa example is that we know that the signal that, um, that is sent from where the plant is touched to the leaves that move is actually an electrical signal. It involves changes in the polarity of, across cell membranes of the plant cell that is roughly analogous to what we saw when we looked at how neurons work. These changes in depolarization aren't as rapid or as organized as action potentials, but nonetheless, they represent an elegant kind of rapid internal uh, signaling mechanism. Clearly, all complex organisms, even one that may seem slow and invariant to our animal eyes, have evolved exquisite adaptations for controlling their internal environment and for responding to external cues they receive from the outside world in which they live.